Welcome to the Jesus Calling Podcast. Today, we talk with two people who know what it's like to lose everything. They share with us how their hope was restored through God's promise that He will never leave us or forsake us. Our first guest is Brett Swain, a sous chef who oversees the cookery, a fully functioning cafe and catering center in Nashville, Tennessee, that provides homeless men with hope and healing, in addition to teaching them professional culinary skills. Brett shares how his journey through homelessness brought him to a place where he now is able to share the hope he found in Christ with others going through the same situation. My name is Brett Swain. I am the executive director of Lambscroft Ministries, which is also tied into the cookery, which is a culinary school and a working cafe in Nashville, Tennessee. I was born in Perth, Western Australia in 1967. And I left Australia uh, in, in the hopes of becoming, I guess, in the end, a better person in 91, which landed me first in Europe. I was playing at a ski resort uh, as a um, nighttime musician in entertainment um, in Hofgarten, Austria. From there, I traveled over to England to get to my intended destination, which was America in April 91, with my parents being divorced and, uh, you know, growing up in a broken family. And there were so many things happening on the inside of a kid that you don't have words for. I had the, the thoughts and the dreams, and I, I just always felt like if you, if you dreamed it and you were sincere in your dreaming and you were um, diligent in your effort, that you can get anything that you wanted, that you wanted to be in life. And um, for me, when music came along, I was actually wanting to be a, an Australian Air Force pilot. So that was quite a, a real deviation. But I remember studying calculus in my room and uh, my mum had got me a keyboard after much nagging. And uh, as I was studying probability and calculus, I leaned over and I hit this chord, this progression. And, and I was you know, very new to music, but I remember a feeling just whooshed through the inside of me that I, I felt more alive. The exhilaration was like um, being on a roller coaster. When music entered my life and, and, and gave me color, I ran after it with everything I had. From there, I saved up all my money and I landed in LA and I met my friend Rod Scala, who came from Australia, and we were gonna do this dream together. Within about two weeks of living pretty much on Venice Beach, we were running out of money. It was expensive in LA and there were no leads. My friend Rod had heard about this place called the Third Coast in Austin, Texas. I didn't even know what that meant. All I knew was we were running out and Rod said, we gotta do something, let's go. So we used our last money to buy a car. We left LA and I remember driving for about five hours and then I think we were still in LA. So I didn't know how <laughs> I didn't know American cities were so big and you all drove on the wrong side of the road. So that was quite an adventure and eventually we made it to a place in Texas called Austin and we stayed there for about seven, eight years just at first taking odd jobs. And we were lucky. We started working on 6th Street, just working in the bars and helping out to eventually um, forming a band and we became one of the bands on 6th Street. And we did that for a good amount of years and I was writing music, um, but I didn't realize that for me music had become an idol. I didn't even know what an idol was. I didn't grow up in church. I didn't understand the things of the spirit at all. All I knew is I was chasing after this thing, trying to get life from success of music. Um, it made me feel good when I wrote something good. I felt alive. When nothing would come, I felt worthless. Um, I would practice. I would practice maybe as many as 10 to 14 hours a day, just constantly, constantly drilling on my instrument and writing music. And that's all I thought about, all I chased. If I just made it, I'd be able to help my mom buy her a house and look after the people that I, that I cared for and, and perhaps um, be accepted. It was in fullness an idol. But it led me to no life. I ended up moving to Dallas, Texas. I got 
married for the wrong reasons and tried to make the best of a very broken relationship where Jesus was not in the middle, where love and light was not the center. I came to uh, that address, end of your rope, where I just inwardly imploded and I lost, I lost all my family, I lost all my clothes, down to my toothbrush, I lost my career, such as it was, I lost my friends, I, I was very hurt and a very wounded individual. And um, in a time of malice, I committed adultery, which led to the loss of everything. Uh, all my friends, when they found out, everybody just scattered. It was like an H-bomb had gone off, and there was nothing but dust upon the ground all around me. I just looked around and everything was gone. I felt like I needed to do anything that I could to repair the damage that I had done. I was so sorry for what I had done. But there was nothing that would repair it. Each day it got worse and worse. And I felt like my soul was being crushed. I felt like a car that had taken off, off the road, off a cliff. And I was in the air, there was no traction underneath me and the steering wheel was just spaghetti in my hands. But the sense of panic, you're in the air now, but the crash is coming. That's what it felt like. I woke up one morning with this, this unction, this, this sense of go look for a Bible. And I didn't even know we had one in the house. I looked through the house and I found a Bible and I opened it up and I found myself in a lot of the bad parts. But the most incredible thing about reading that red word was I felt somehow it was reading me. It was like inches from my face. I couldn't believe that a man from 2000 years ago was speaking so plainly and completely and intimately to my situation right now. I started reading the other parts where it promised forgiveness and mercy and, and healing and restoration. And all I know is that I wanted, I wanted out of where I was and I needed, I needed to be fixed. I needed healing, I needed forgiveness more, more than I needed my next breath. Night after night, chasing, chasing. I began to pray and fast. For seven months, I wept before that book, praying for many, many, many hours each day. That's all I did. But things around me still didn't get better. And each day I would still pray and pray, and hoping, thinking that it meant that people would be restored around me, even as I was being restored. But my situation just grew worse. So Christmas Eve, I go to the church. Old St. Andrews. And I'm sitting in the upper loft area. I'd never been to church at Christmas. And here I was, 33, 34. And um, I look to my left and there's this daddy playing with his little girl. And I cannot tell you the pain that I felt because I knew I lost my family. It was my fault. I'd lost the intimacy with my little girl. And I remember saying in my heart, I would never wish this pain on even my worst enemy. And the curious thing happened was suddenly a picture of my dad came to my mind. I had never thought of my dad as my worst enemy, ever. He left when I was five. He had had an affair. I was no better. I had followed. As I said that, I knew I had to forgive him and I did, because I wouldn't want this pain on him. I didn't want to wish this pain on him or anyone. So I forgave my dad right there. In that time where I was touched, I was cleansed, I was 
I was forgiven. My mind was washed. My consciousness, the guilt had gone. And it felt like my mind was cellophane again. It was so clear. It was so wonderful. There was more wreckage to happen, I guess, more devastation. Uh, I, I, I don't know if that's the correct word, but, but the journey to being released took another three months. When you find out God is real, you want to do what he says. And I read in the book, it says, this is how you're going to travel with no money, the clothes that you got. I had my Bible. I had my traveling papers because I'm a foreigner and um, a one-way ticket. So I got on a Greyhound. And I traveled at 15 hours, which was a trip not from heaven. It was uh, quite an event. When I got closer and closer to, to Nashville, I began to pray even more earnestly, please, Lord, who am I supposed to see? But I remember rounding the corner on the, on the highway, on that Greyhound, and looking to downtown Nashville. And at some point, the Lifeway building came into view. There was a building in the middle of Nashville with a cross on it. Out of all the cities he could have sent me, he sends me to a city that had a cross on it. In the morning, I met a homeless man. And after talking with the homeless man and he found out my situation, he said, there's a mission just around the corner from the Greyhound. And I said, a mission, there's a cost to get there. No, 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 we can walk. It's literally just around the corner. I couldn't believe that God in this city had organized a place for me to go get some food and a bed that was in walking. I didn't even have bus fare. I was praising God. I was so happy until I entered the mission. And I saw the brokenness and the dirt and the hopelessness and despair. So the four months that I was living in the mission, you know, uh, as with everything, when we're going through something, you don't know when the completion date is. So looking back now, four months didn't seem so long, but every day pain elongates time. And I remember thinking, if I could just get through the morning, okay, Lord, I know you're going to do something during the midday. All right, then maybe you're going to do something by the afternoon. Okay, Lord, it's night time, so I guess you're going to do it tomorrow. Good night. It's just every day was this grind and this reaching. And I remember um, that I just felt comforted that he was with me. And, and I, at some point, I decided to help out at the mission. I wanted to give back. I just didn't want to eat and sleep and, and go off. I would go to every Bible study, every church service I could. I, that's how I filled my day. I, I decided at some point, I'll, I'll go help out in the kitchens at the mission. That's how I'll give back. I, I, I like to cook. I, I wouldn't have called myself a chef or anything. I just like to cook and, and help out. So I helped out in the kitchen. And uh, every morning I would work until about 11, and then I would head off to daily mass or Bible study, whatever I could do. And this went on for months and months and months. Many miracles are happening my heart is beginning to turn. I'm beginning to see God amongst the poor. Before that moment, I just wanted to get out of my situation. But over time in the situation, he developed a heart for the broken. I said, oh God, I've changed. I don't want to get out of here. If you want me to live amongst the poor for the rest of my life, I will. And I meant it, you can't fake surrender. It was a moment I guess God was waiting for. It was the graduating moment, I, I can only assume. Within a couple of days, someone from Fleming Steakhouse had come on community service, and his name was Thomas Oglesby. And within a short while working with me, he offered me a job at the Nashville store. I went, I got hired, I started as an entry-level prep cook and did a day cleaner. Within a few months, they saw the grace and the integrity of my walk in him, I guess. It was just all him. They offered me the keys to the restaurant to open it. A little while after that, they're flying me to different parts of the country to open up brand new Fleming stores and train opening crews. And eventually, I became the second chef in charge of the Nashville store. During all this time, we're still helping the poor. We're still feeding the poor every weekend. I'm still keeping in contact with the friendships that I'd made with certain fellows at the, at the mission. Every day it was just me and Jesus. 
During the time at Fleming's after the first year, I asked my bosses, Gabe Fairchild and Tracy Riddick, I asked them the two days of the year that Fleming's was closed was Thanksgiving and Christmas. And for the poor, they're amongst the hardest days because everyone has family to go to. Would they let me open up Fleming's just to feed a small group of folks? They said, as long as I was involved with it and made sure that everything was clean and safe, I could. So the first time we did it, it was 26 people maybe. Eight years later, it was about 400. And the joy in that room was indescribable. My friend Terry Kemper, who helped uh, begin uh, the Woodbine Emergency Shelter, which we did every Wednesday and Saturday for six years. I'd been talking to her about not just taking care of the needs, the immediate needs of survival, but teaching everything that Flemings had taught me and, and giving these guys hope and a new sense of identity. She found a building which became the cookery. I understood. I had such great joy to see what he had done with my life. And I also had sorrow that he didn't tell me at the beginning because my pride perhaps would have gotten in the way. But it strengthened me. I knew my time was, was over. The next year, I had left Flemings. I would given my notice. I had done everything uh, to my best uh, ability. It was just a God thing. And so it gave me peace knowing that I had done the right thing. And we began construction for the cookery. Terry found this building on 12 South, and it was a wreck of a building. There was burnt wood, the windows were holes in the wall, and the toilets were just holes in the floor. It was nothing built to code. It was a mess. It was a wreck on the inside. No electricity. Uh, the subfloor was exposed. Terry said God gave her that this was going to be a city on the hill. and. She said it would take her around about three months, she thought, to restore it. It didn't take three months, it took nearly three years. And back then, 12 South was a pretty scary area. It's, everything's changed now. But I remember we had no money, and yet each month, rent was there. I think uh, in, we're coming up to the fourth year now, and we've had probably close to 30 men come and go. I would like to say that all of them have received freedom and all of them are doing well. We had a, a young man, Jordan, who was 23 and he had a, a scholarship at Trevecca for basketball and, and he just lost himself and he needed to come for God. We've had other young men come because they need a deeper touch from the Lord. We've had some with mental illness. We have some that have had a moral failure that just seems like too insurmountable they can't get out of. Some that have had a financial failure and they've just given up. Some have been broken by relationships through others' failures, or through other failures. But whichever, whichever come, we take them in and we give them the joy of the Lord and Every one of them, every one of them, know that he is in the house. Several years ago, I had heard about this lady who wrote this book. And all about Jesus. Now, see, for me, ever since I found out Jesus is real, any kind of word like that, my ears perk up. I am all about it. But they said, this lady here, yeah, she lives in Perth. And I went, well, wow, that's my hometown, obviously. And she was a missionary to Japanese uh, immigrants living in Perth. And so I'm, I'm interested in all of this. But I heard that she was from Tennessee. Now, here I am in Tennessee, who had come from Perth. So already in a strange, silly way, I felt like I was kind of connected to this lady. And then I hear later on that she's moved back to Tennessee. And then one day on a Sunday, I walk in and I get told someone wants to meet me. So I go over to the table and this lady introduces herself and says, I'm Sarah. I'm Sarah Young. And I've heard about you, Brett. Immediately, it's, there's a sense of 
um, honor. You want to honor the person in front of you who heard so much about you. She was so easy to talk to. She was so genuine. She was so sincere. And she asked me some questions. I don't share a lot of what I've just shared because it's difficult. It's difficult to go into and really in a rush, rush pace of a cafe. It's not something that you, you feel the liberty to go into deep, deep, deep spiritual things. But Sarah, she took a hold of me and her interest and sincerity, her genuineness said, no, seriously, I, I, I want to hear I get this stuff, and it speaks to me. And I knew that she was real. We have Jesus calling on the front counter of the cookery, and it's open to the public. They just walk in. I see many times people as they're paying the bill or, or wondering while, while they're waiting for their coffee, um, I'll see them leaning over the book and reading. And that's a great blessing to us. I wanted to share June 10th, um, and I'll read it. Rest in me, my child. Give your mind a break from planning and trying to anticipate what will happen. Pray continually. Asking my spirit to take charge of the details of this day. Remember that you are on a journey with me. When you try to peer into the future and plan for every possibility, you ignore your constant companion who sustained you moment by moment. As you gaze anxiously into the distance, you don't even feel the strong grip of my hand holding yours. How foolish you are, my child. Remembrance of me is a daily discipline. Never lose sight of my presence with you. This will keep you resting in me all day, every day. The scriptures are pray continuously, 1 Thessalonians 5.17 and Psalm 62.5. Find rest on my soul in God alone. My hope comes from him. He's promised to be with us. So that passage of finding rest in me knowing that he's right there. Sometimes, as I did, when I went through homelessness, I felt like I'd fallen into a pit where the world no longer could find me or see me. No one could reach out to me. I had no money to call home. No one knew where I was. When he shows you the way out, what you thought was a pit was actually a well that was dug and from that well you draw mercy and compassion and wisdom and knowledge and refreshment. From the depths of that well it goes on and on and on. When I see someone struggling who feels like they've lost everything, I remember one of the brothers upstairs, Bruce, showed up and he was weeping in his wreckage. And I startled him because I said, this is going to sound crazy to you right now but you're in a very good place. He thought I was crazy. But when I share about what God has done, it gives him strength to take another breath. The word of the testimony. I share what he has achieved. And they look around and they see this restaurant and they see everything that's happened. It speaks, it's the story that speaks. And that's what gives people uh, a sense of hope and it fills them. The food that we give is not just physical. When they hear these things, it becomes a strengthening of the soul. Brett continues to spread the message of hope and healing to those he serves every day. For more information about The Cookery, visit thecookery.org. Next on the Jesus Calling Podcast, we talk with Sherry Taylor, a graduate from The Next Door, a faith-based rehabilitation center in Nashville. But first, a brief message about how you can get a free audiobook from audible.com. As a special offer to you, the listeners of the Jesus Calling Podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. Find your favorite Sarah Young titles, including Jesus Calling and Jesus Always, in an audiobook version, and get it for free by trying audible.com. Check out a small sample of the Jesus Calling audiobook featured at the end of this podcast. To download an entire free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash Jesus Calling. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash Jesus Calling for your full free audiobook.
Now, on to our interview with Sherry Taylor. The Next Door is a faith-based rehabilitation center based in Nashville, Tennessee. Sherry Taylor came to The Next Door after a long battle with substance abuse. She shares with us how God led her to seek help at The Next Door and how she found hope to begin a new life, free from the chains of addiction. My name is Sherry Taylor, and I graduated from The Next Door um, September 2015. Um, I was born and raised in Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, I'm an only child to my mom and stepfather. Um, who are um, still at home, still very healthy and happy. Um, a huge support. Um, I have a, a large group of cheerleaders, um, faith-based uh, family. When I was a kid, I remember having somewhat a personal relationship. I turned my life over to Christ. My grandmother took me to church all the time, but my parents weren't going at the time. We looked good on the outside. I was taught to do that at an early age. We looked well. The house could be in total chaos, total chaos. But we would uh, get up and go to school as if nothing happened. You go do your best and make the grades, and and uh, no one should know about what goes on inside your household. So that was one of the secrets. Um, and so I did that. I was dressed up from head to toe, matching all the time, um, to go to school and where I where I did well, getting along with others and uh, fitting in, um, getting involved in lots of activities all the time, especially to keep me away from home so much. Um, I wanted to be gone all the time. My parents uh, would argue, and I understood later on that my father struggled with alcoholism. After I graduated from high school and I had my daughter, my senior year of high school, I was engaged to her father who went on to the military and that relationship didn't work out well. Um, I think early on then I started to define myself based on a little bit of that rejection. I started to um, define myself, but I still had some fight in me. And so I went to school and graduated as an, a licensed nurse and passed my state exam. Um, and, and early on, I, got my, I, I had my own apartment at the time. I was a young single mother, and um, I was around other people who, on the weekends, the way they wound down, they, the way they would wind down was to drink and party. And that was my first recollection of being introduced to any type of substance. Um, I remember um, finding ways and means to control that. Um, I would only do that on the weekends. Um, I quickly got involved in, uh, still involved off and on in my church and interacting with my family and raising my child. Um, I remember by the end of nursing school, though, before I started working in clinical nursing, I was pregnant again with my daughter, my son. I remember being, oh, no, I'm a single parent again. I, I just remember that rejection sending me to a place where I never thought I would go. Um, Didn't feel too good about myself. Even though I was constantly surrounded around people who spoke positive into me, you can do whatever you want to do. Um, Just do it. And so um, there, I think, chemicals became my friend, I thought. And uh, slowly, um, over the next several years, well, I'd say the next three or four years, my addiction not, became not just something I did for recreation, but something I came to depend on. And it quick, quickly spiraled out of control to the point where I found myself saying I need help. And I, I struggled with that because I came from a family who didn't tell their business. Nobody was getting help. I feel like a lot of people needed it, but not a lot of people were getting help. And um, I took a risk. I'm grateful to God today that um, I was... Uh, encouraged to get the help and um, that was my first introduction to uh, self-help and 12-step help and formal treatment and my introduction and acknowledgement that um, addiction is a disease. I learned through education in the first treatment center that I went in that it wasn't a moral deficiency and for a long time I thought I was just bad, made bad decisions and I was not a good person. from that first uh, treatment center, um, I was able to grow. Um, in the in the next year or so, I was uh, working again in the field of my choice, uh, still in nursing. I had not incurred any legal matters or hurt myself or hurt anybody else to the point where I faced any legal problems. A lot of it was spiritual bankruptcy, uh, just feeling bad about myself and hoping, I found hope again through that first treatment that I uh, I could maybe live through this if I could get some help. And I did. Um, I met my first husband in the rooms of recovery. Um, I raised my children 
in the rooms of recovery and, and gained some friendships that are still true and, and have lasted that many years. Um, since 93 is my first recollection. Um, from 93 to 2004, very active, um, you know, in the community, in my church, with my children, as a mother, as a wife, um, worked full time. We also ran a business. I began to struggle and I didn't want a divorce, but we weren't getting along very well. And when I asked for a separation, instead, my husband filed for a divorce. And I found myself in an amount of emotional pain I hadn't ever experienced before. But I was able to stay clean still. Uh, by then, I had about eight years clean. So this was up until about 2002. I went home a couple of times hoping that would work out. And with that and just simple isolation, working too much, trying to cover up those feelings, not letting somebody know what was really going on with me, um, I also experienced the death of a close relative that I feel like really pushed me over the edge. Why would I go back to something uh, this terrifying to me that something that was so horrific early on that um, hurt me and, and the lives of many people around me would be reconsidered once again? And I did reconsider that, and before I knew it, I was under the influence of substances again. Throughout this time, I've always been encouraged to um, seek God, um, practice your faith, you know, hold on, things are going to get better. And I think I did for, for the most part. I never gave up on that. I can remember um, using substances and asking God while I was using the substances, Lord, if you would please just relieve me of this madness. Um, so I'm grateful that somewhere a foundation was laid a long time ago. I don't think I'd be where I'm at today. After that divorce and death and my relapse, um, it has taken me almost 11 years to get back. I remember going through a... a, a multitude of feelings, less than, shame, guilt. Then I'd get a little bit of hope, and I'd go seek some help, and it would work for a while, but I couldn't stay consistently clean anymore. I was in so much pain, so broken. Didn't want to live, but I didn't want to die. Um, I had spent the last 11 years um, trying to put together a, a significant amount of time free from chemical dependency, um, it got so bad. I had nowhere to go. I refused to involve my family. I moved here and, and did the ge geographical change to, to do better. But the opposite happened. After about nine months, I was back out into the streets using um, around some very dangerous people. I'm exposed to very dangerous situations. Uh, only by the grace of God have I been able to come out of that. Um, I really felt like I needed to go somewhere I was going to die, literally. The last couple of times I used, um, I lost control of my senses of what was going on around me. I felt like I was leaving here physically, and I was around nobody that was willing to help. I remember crawling to get to a bathtub to put cold water on me because I literally felt like I was dying. Um, that scared me, and it, but probably the thing that scared me into change. Um, it took me 11 years of, of uh, going through what was a spiral, out of control spiral of uh, using a destructive behavior um, where uh, everyone was affected. Um, every aspect of my life was affected. My job, uh, my well-being, um, my ability to maintain friendships, relationships, and even just to take care of myself. It was absolutely horrible. I um, never thought I would live that way, but that's exactly where it took me, and that's exactly where it will take you. If you're stuck um, using um, jail, institution, or death is the message that I'm given. Um, and those, those all became a reality for me except death. I know that I was knocking on death's door. I had no more chances left. I would rather die, but I knew I was, uh, did not have the nerve to do anything to myself. Never gave it any real thought and that that was the easy, cheap way out, and I needed to do something different. I was in so much denial. I, actually, the day that I found out about this place, the next door, I pick up the phone to uh, call for a job interview. And somehow, I was dialing for help. And I understand that I believe that was the Holy Spirit intervening in my life. And um, I was able to talk to a clearinghouse who directed me here. I had no insurance. I had been living from pillar to post with whoever would allow me to stay. And I came to the next door, January 12, 2015. I never will forget it. And I walked in the door and placed my bags down. And from the first time I stepped in this building, 
the the Holy Spirit, I just felt like completely took over. Maybe I felt it in, I'm sure I felt it in different degrees. It became greater as the longer I stayed here, but there was a, an angel, I, I'm sure she was a volunteer at the time, who met me at the front lobby and consoled me while I waited to get um, my bag searched and go through the admissions process. Um, and from that point on, the staff here um, never made me feel disrespected. In fact, it was total opposite. I felt so bad about myself, and I understood that these people believed in us from the very start. They believed in me from the very start. They spoke that. Everything about their walk, their talk, was not put on or didn't feel rehearsed. It was so genuine that um, I felt like God really had sent me to a place I needed to be. I was um, welcomed by a young lady who I think wanted to give nothing but her time. And uh, she was able to console my nerves for making such a big decision. So I didn't sit there by myself. Um, I was given a bag that had every um, toiletry that a woman could ever need, entering a place to actually stay for an, an indefinite amount of time. From the very t first time I stepped into the building, until then, um, there was a change going on inside of me, and I knew that this being a faith-based program, from the very time you step in the door, you were given a gift bag, and Jesus Calling was in the gift bag. So I started reading that first off. I had some experience in recovery, and I knew that daily meditation and keeping my mind on, um, keeping my mind on the Word of God would help me become focused like I needed to be. And, and just through those few days of opening that book and being surrounded around what I consider phenomenal staff, transition had already started taking place in my life. I had no idea what would end up where I'm at today. Um, over the next few months, I was able to maintain employment. I started feeling better about myself because I could pay my rent. I had somewhere safe and sound to come to. And it wasn't just a place to lay my head. There was something special going on inside this building. And it's still very special to me today. I've never felt so well respected. I celebrate 18 months, the 12th of July, um, almost two years again. And I couldn't manage to put nine months together before over an 11 year period. So it speaks volumes to me today um, that God is working in my life. And I'm so grateful that he chose the next door to do that. They have a number one cheerleader, a fan from forever and ever. And um, so does Sarah Young um, in this Jesus Calling. I was home visiting my parents recently, and my dad woke up that morning, and he was drinking a cup of coffee, walking through the house, and he was carrying a Jesus Calling. And it almost sends chills through me because I thought, wow, that really is a popular book. I am not just saying it because I am on tape. It's affecting my, my livelihood, my, the people around me that mean so much to me. Um, enjoy this book tremendously. I've been able to get settled and recentered when I've been off, feel like I'm off my game, so to speak, um, by reading. Um, I find peace by reading. Its direct relation to God's Word is continues to be uh, life-saving and life-changing for me. I get a lot of peace out of it. Um, one of my favorites, and it's uh, May 26th, and it says, in a world of unrelenting changes, I am the one who never changes. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. I created a beautifully ordered world, one that reflected my perfection. Now, however, the world is under the bondage of sin and evil. Every person on the planet faces gaping jaws of uncertainty. The only antidote to this poisonous threat is drawing closer to me. In my presence, you can face uncertainty with perfect peace. And I think that's just amazing. There's all kinds of things going on that are outside of my control, but this word just holds true time and time again. Um, in, in good times, in celebration, I've been able to go to this book. In troubled times, obviously, I've been able to go to this book. I just know that God loves me so much. That's why he placed me here. Um, when I moved over to transition over to the apartments, uh, again, I've been able to, um, I worked outside my field for about a year just to get focused. I was able to return to my field. 
And by the grace of God, not only did I return to my field, but I returned to this field um, as well, helping other people, and particularly women who are recovering. Um, I'm on the front lines. I work for a company who um, provides detox services to, to struggling women who struggle with alcohol and addiction. And um, for those who don't know, um, there's an epidemic very real in our life today. And um, I'm able to be a small part of that um, by sharing uh, my own experience, strength, and hope. We're following through. I am, and lots of women like me are following through through the calling on their life as well, where they've been affected by this greatly. And um, they're waiting for someone to ask them the same thing, is that why not? Why not me? And absolutely, there's a way you can get out. There's always a way. Don't ever give up on yourself, and don't ever give up on God. He's working. He's alive. He's well, and His Word is so true. And it's absolutely life-changing. It has been for me, and it can be for you, too. If you or someone you know is dealing with a substance abuse problem and needs help, please visit The Next Door's website at thenextdoor.org or call them at 855-202-4784. That's 855-202-4874. Next time on the Jesus Calling Podcast, we'll visit with two young authors who are encouraging women who are struggling to create their identity around an ideal that has been given to us by the world to find their identity in Christ. Here's a preview of our interview with Jenny Allen, the author of Nothing to Prove, Why We Can Stop Trying So Hard. I think the grace of God is to reveal the places that we've depended on ourselves or things in this world more than Him. And He wants a relationship with us ultimately. And so what draws us back to that? A lot of times it's it's our need for Him and our recognition that these things that we chase are not actually satisfying us. Today's featured passage comes from the May 26th entry of the Jesus Calling audiobook. In a world of unrelenting changes, I am the one who never changes. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Find in me the stability for which you have yearned. I created a beautifully ordered world, one that reflected my perfection. Now, however, the world is under the bondage of sin and evil. Every person on the planet faces gaping jaws of uncertainty. The only antidote to this poisonous threat is drawing closer to me. In my presence, you can face uncertainty with perfect peace. Hear more great stories about the impact Jesus Calling is having all over the world. Be sure to subscribe to the Jesus Calling podcast on iTunes. We value your reviews and comments so we can reach even more people with the message of Jesus Calling. And if you have your own story to share, we'd love to hear from you. Visit JesusCalling.com to share your story today.